our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Bishop Eric Kincaid Clark, and I am excited to minister the good word of God to you on this Wednesday evening. It is our midweek sacrifice, and we want you to hit all the buttons, like, share, follow, and subscribe. Thank God for our new followers, for our new subscribers. We appreciate you tuning in, plugging into this ministry. I am looking forward to being your corner man. I'm going to be the one feeding you with knowledge and understanding of the word of God. Tonight, we have a very, very powerful lesson that I feel like prepares us and readies us, amen, to enter into a special time of sacrificial worship as we are planning this Sunday. Last Sunday, we had an awesome time. It was phenomenal as we worship the Lord, amen, in a, uh, in the, what is it, the, the movie theater, uh, the, the silver spot. That's what I'm looking for, the silver spot movie theater. We'll be there again this Sunday. We'll receive communion and we are going to minister the word of God in that setting as well. Uh, not to mention this Sunday, we have designated as our super seed Sunday. It's something that we do once a year where we ask God's people to sacrifice something special unto the Lord. And that is a $500 seed or a $1,000 seed. We've asked all God's people, amen, in addition to their tithe, if they would prepare a special gift of worship for the Lord that we will receive this Sunday. We're asking all of our partners, all of our members, family, and friends to join us in this special time of worship. With that, there's a powerful word that I want to share. I want to teach you something that I believe uh, is just revolutionary in his thinking. We have been on a series of messages entitled um, Leadership Principles from the David Narrative. As we've been going through the study and the story of David, we've been taking out truths and principles and uh, something has come to my attention. And we're going to scan, we're going we're gonna to skirt right by David on tonight. There's a portion that he has, but he's not going to be our main focus and subject matter. We'll return to that, amen, as soon as we can. And I say that, I say that because in the coming days, I may want to follow up, amen, with this teaching, with this presentation that I am giving you on tonight. Because I, I think this is a, a big loaf of bread. Uh, it might be a little too large for us to digest in one setting. Uh, and so let's hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Again, like and share, follow and subscribe. Call your family and friends, gather your household together, and let's enter into our ministry protocols. That is, control your environment. Amen. Don't multitask. Uh, let's give this 30 minutes to a teaching that we can understand the word of the Lord. Tonight, we'll go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, and we'll spring from that with a very powerful thought. And it reads, Revelation 4 and 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. By your will they exist and were created. I think the King James Version says, For your pleasure and for your purpose they were created. But here we see in Revelation chapter 4 that God created all things for his pleasure, for his purpose. God created you. God created me. He created all things for his pleasure and for his purpose. It all belongs to God. It all comes from God. And it's all been created by God for his pleasure and for his purpose. Certainly we understand that you belong to God, I belong to God, we belong to God, and everything that is has come out of the mouth of God, has come out of the thought plan and purpose of God. For our subject matter on tonight, I want to talk about the worship of preparation. Everybody, type it in, the worship of preparation. If you're visiting with us on tonight, Amen. Say something. And everyone that's on, say something. We want to know that you're in the room. Amen. Like it, share it, follow and subscribe. Hit all the buttons. But you can activate and uh, uh, participate with us by typing in our subject matter tonight as I'll be speaking from this subject matter, the worship of preparation. We've been created for the pleasure and the purpose of God. And let's take a look at worship 
but a special worship, and that is the worship of preparation. Father, I thank you now for allowing us to assemble together in your name, even by way of the internet. Smile upon us and give us favor. Remove the thorny, stony, and wayside ground. Get that out of our heart, Lord, and let our hearts be clean and pure. Speak to us that our hearts and minds be open to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church as we prepare to worship. You show us tonight through your word that preparation in and of itself is worship. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Tonight, I want to delve into it. I want to take a look at three phases of worship through preparation, and that is, number one, the building of an altar, number two, the preparing of a sacrifice, and number three, the consecration for ministry. Uh, I, I want to show you that there are all kinds of ways that you could worship God. Uh, the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice, so obeying God is a form of worship. And then we talk about those um, Hebrew words for praise, halal, which means to scream aloud, to shine and to boast, to rave. The shabak, that means to shout unto God. Amen. Psalm 47, clap your hands, O ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And then there is the tehillah, which means to sing. Amen. That's a very common form of worship. We sing on to the Lord. We lift our voices and sing, but even the Barak, to bow before the Lord, to bless the Lord, amen, to lay prostrate before the Lord is a form of worship. Not only that, giving, giving of offerings, giving of sacrificial offerings, giving of our time, amen, our energy, our talent, our treasure, and amen to God, all of our strength as we give ourselves to the work of the Lord, even that is our worship. We bring the sacrifice of praise. Sacrificing, um, not giving in to a thing, um, not taking liberties, restraining and restricting yourselves from different things that may not be sinful, but it's just something that you've chose to give, to release, not to indulge in, for the Lord. That becomes your worship, your worship, your worship. Taking some liberties or refusing to take liberties can be your worship. So worship is going to present itself in many forms. I want to show you on tonight through the word of God that preparation is a form of worship. I believe that you could understand it in this uh, scenario. Uh, I, I love a good meal. I love a good meal. One more again, I love a good meal. Now, I'm not a chef. I'm not a cook. And one of the reasons why is because I don't have the grace or the patience of preparation. It's a lot of work involved. In my younger, much younger years, I got a little job for a short period of time as a prep cook. I understand preparation in a restaurant. Um, I had to prepare croutons to be made. I had to slice and dice different vegetables. I, I just spent the whole day preparing. Now, people came in for dinner, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight at night, and um, they may enjoy the meal, and I hope they did, but um, their meal started being prepared, sometimes days in advance, but certainly early that morning, there was a lot of preparation that went involved. Now, there might be some that say, um, why would they pay $100 for a plate of food? In some cases, even more than that. And that's because of the presentation. But the presentation evol involves more than the cooking of the meal. It involves the preparation. Oh, yeah, you, you'll pay a lot of money because they may have um, a, a fine dining space. They may have a live band. They may have um, very upgraded silverware and china that you're eating on. The lighting might be dynamic. Um, there are a number of things. Even the servers might have a, a higher level of training that elevates the price of your meal. But also, there is a lot of preparation that goes into uh, specific meals. You know, they will marinate certain pieces of meat for those meat eaters. Sometimes 
uh, days at a time. They will, days, this particular item is marinating, is being prepared, is being saturated with flavor. So when you get it, the flavor is amazing, but this is a result of its preparation. And you're paying for it. You're, you're valuing the whole presentation, and yet part of the presentation is preparation. The same is true when it comes to worship, that part of our worship is preparation. It's preparing. I, I, I ministered a, a, a word for Resurrection Sunday, and we spent weeks putting that message together. Uh, the sermon, the video presentation, um, uh, editing, sound, music, everything that was involved, it took a lot of work and a lot of time. You may have gotten the presentation in about an hour uh, from an uh, hour and 15 minutes from start to finish, worship and GPS and preaching and teaching and all that was involved, but it was weeks and weeks and even prior to the weeks, years and years of learning God's word and learning how to communicate and learning to walk in faith and having courage to do something different and to step out in faith and to organize and plan and think through and strategize in such a way that we can have a successful service. There are a lot of people that don't understand that. But if you've ever been an event planner, if you've ever put on a play, if you've ever been involved in any kind of presentation that was designed to serve a hundred people, a thousand people or beyond, you know there is practice, there is rehearsal. Talk about actors and actresses. Talk, amen, to recording artists, musicians. Talk to singers and people that perform. There is so much preparation that goes into a presentation when it's mind blowing. I'm telling you, I've been to Broadway. It's been years, but I've been to Broadway and I've seen the plays. I've been to Las Vegas and I've seen the shows. And believe me, they don't set that stuff up in a day. They don't learn those moves over a week or two. This is weeks and months and years even of practicing and honing in their skill. And so when you go and you pay $100 $300, $500. They tell me for Beyonce to see her live in concert, some people were paying $5,000, $10,000, even higher than that for the presentation. But the presentation again, it was not put together overnight. There was months and weeks and years in some cases of preparation all with sound, with lighting, with dancing, with singing, with musicianship, with performance, with organizing, with security, with printing and marketing and advertising. It's just so much that goes into it. That's what drives the value of a thing up. It's the presentation and the preparation that you've put into the presentation, even our preparation for worship, for giving is worship. All that goes into it is worship. You know, it's like it's like the man that says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cook my wife dinner tonight. And um he has got to rearrange his whole day. Dinner is going to be served at six o'clock. He cuts his day in half. He gets off at 12. He runs to the grocery store. He's got a list of things to buy. He buys those things. He come home. He's going through the recipes to cook it and to prepare it and to do this. He calls his mom. He reads this. He gets some instructions. He's doing this. He burnt the bread. So he's got to go get some more bread. He does this whole thing. And then he cleans up. He straightens up everything. Oh my God. He sets the table out. He got the candles out. He got the right music on. He didn't listen to 37 different songs. That ain't the right song. That ain't, oh, I got the right song. And he got everything just right. Hey, he got the rose petals. He's got the candy. He's got the gifts. It's the whole, it's, the, and when she comes home, she is surprised. And it's not just the taste of the steak. It's not just the dress that's in a box 
it's not just the small mints and chocolates that are on the table in arranged in such a, a romantic way. It's not just the balloon or the cards or all of all of the trimmings. It, it's not one thing that stands out why she's overwhelmed with love and appreciation is because she knows that he planned this. He prepared this. He put time and energy and strategizing into it. And so guess what? What if, what if the food is not that wonderful? It, it, it might not, it might not extinguish her appreciation what if what if what if the candle keeps going out or there's just something wrong you know what it's no big deal why because she sees the real genuine effort that has been put into the prep presentation in the way of preparation you mean you took off your job early you mean you planned in advance, you called your mother, you got a recipe, you mean that you plan to have the kids away and you strategize, you mean that you took some extra money and set it aside in preparation for this night to express your love to me, to express your appreciation for me. That's what makes the impact. It's not the food on the plate. It's the whole idea of you putting your heart, your mind, your time, your energy, your soul into the presentation. It is the preparation that has value. Tonight, again, I didn't already took up a lot of my time, but I want to show you through the word of God that our preparation can be worshiped. In light of the super seed coming, amen, I want to encourage you that the preparation, preparing, a, 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 lot of, a lot of us can't just immediately come up with $500 that you could give to the work of the Lord. Even rare, more rare, $1,000. No, no, no. You got to prepare. You got to strategize. You got to plan. You might have to do some extra things to generate more income. You might have to strategize to double up a, a couple of things so you can have your special gift for the Lord. Listen, in a case like that, it's not always the money. It's not always the 500, the thousand or whatever it is your super seed is. It's in the fact that it, it worshiping God in a sacrificial way as, as we have been instructed is, is important enough for you to prepare. It's important enough for you to make arrangements. It's important enough for you to rearrange, to make some phone calls to do what has to be done, to sacrifice. And that is what we offer unto the Lord. In case you didn't know it, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and everybody that lives on the planet. It all belongs to God. How can you give God anything when he owns everything? So how does your worship have value? You must put value in your presentation. How do I put value in my presentation? You got to prepare. Prepare. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. Prepare for prayer. Prepare to worship. Prepare to sing. Prepare to teach, to preach. Prepare to worship. You got a gift? Okay, let's prepare. You don't want to just reach in your pocket and flip out $5 with no preparation because if your heart ain't in it, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything to God. We must prepare. We must prepare. We must prepare because the preparation is worship. Type it in, my preparation is my worship. My preparation is my worship. 
<laughs> oh my God, let's go. Again, three phases. Number one, build, building an ark. Number two, sacrificing or preparing a sacrifice. Number three, consecrating for ministry. Let's first of all, take a look at building an ark. What goes into building, excuse me, an altar? Let me say it properly. Building an altar, preparing a sacrifice, and consecrating for ministry. All of this speaks to us of preparation. It is worship. So throughout the scripture, we have many that built an altar. Let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. Abraham, I want to go down. Look at Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse number nine. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. He built an altar. That's what I want you to see. Look at Jacob chapter, uh, Genesis 35, verse six and seven. Look at four, look, we're looking at how they built an altar. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that he is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Here we see Jacob builds an altar. Take a look at Moses in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, write, for this is a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Look at Joshua. Joshua is not exempt either. In Joshua chapter eight, verse number 30, it says this, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebo. Gideon also, Gideon picks it up in Judges 6 and 22. It says, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel or that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord, because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Orpah of the uh, Abizarites. How about Samuel, For Samuel chapter seven, verse 17. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in the circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel uh, in all those places. And he returned to Ramah, for there was his house. He lived in Ramah, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar. He built an altar. Uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, amen, David is in trouble with God, and there's a plague running through, and, and, and what does David do? Verse 20, and Ornan looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Ornan went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Ornan said, wherefore is my lord the king come uh, to the servant, to his servant? And David said, I, I come to bow the threshing floor of thee because I got to build the Lord an altar that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, uh, let my lord, the king, take uh, and offer up what seemeth good to him. Wherefore, here, uh, here's the oxen for your burnt sacrifice and the threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these uh, did Ornan, uh, he, he tried to give them to the king, verse 23. He said, please accept this from your servant, verse 24. And the king said to Ornan, no but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and ox for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord. David built an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. How about Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 25, and three times in a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar, which he built unto the Lord. 
my God. Let me stop right there. Let me stop right there. Uh, altars were built. Who built the altars? Everybody, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, David, Solomon. And you go on and on. Look at the priest. Look at the prophets. Look at the kings. They built the altar. The altar didn't just show up. They built the altar. And there was work that went into the preparation of the altar. When an altar was built, there was the selecting of the location. Either that was determined by God or it was strategically picked out, but normally it was in a mountain or on a hill in a high place. When you built an altar, there was the gathering of the materials. They didn't use metal. They used stones and the stones were stacked one upon another. So there was time and energy that went into carrying stones and fitting the stones to build the altar. And then there was the actual erecting, the actual structure, amen. How big was the altar? And that had to do with what was going to go on the altar. In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 25, he said that the altar had to be made of natural things. Oh, I wish I had time to preach that, that you gotta build your altar and it's got to be built out of natural things. Thank God for prayer. But if you really going to have an altar, it's not going to be the structured 8 to 9 a.m. prayer that is your altar. You got to build it naturally. It's not going to be a system. It's not going to be a mechanism that builds your altar. You got to build your altar. My God. Amen. They had to arrange the stones. They had to, amen, consecrate the altar before they could sacrifice anything on it. And then there was the maintaining of the altar. So when you talk about worship, a lot of people would think it's just the sacrifice. That was the offering. No, it's not just the sacrifice. It's not just what is offered. It is the time, the strategy, the energy, the thinking, the materials, the work, the labor, the labor, the labor, your blood, sweat, and tears. It is the preparation. When you talk about building an altar, there was preparation. I know we'll read it in a, in a second. Just It's a line in the Bible, and they built an altar. You make it read over it in a line or two, but it might have taken them six hours to build the altar. It may have taken them a week and a half to build the altar. Because the worship, is in the preparation. And even when David had a chance to have everything donated, we're going to donate what you're going to give to the Lord. David said, no, you're not. Because <laughs> the worship is in what it costs to me. The worship is in my preparation. It's in the money I spend. It's in the energy and the time that it takes me to get myself together. Coming to our time of worship first Sunday, you ought to get up. You ought to put on your clothes, put on your best. Get out the house early. What, what do you do? I'm preparing, I'm coming in. I'm coming in to worship the Lord, I'm coming in. I'm gonna come in praying. I'm gonna come in greeting and fellowshipping and loving on the people of God. When it's time to worship, I'm gonna stand. I'm gonna lift my hands. I'm gonna lift my voice. I'm gonna get involved, why? Because I prepared. To honor the Lord. When it's time to give, I got mine. Oh, I got mine. Well, how, how you get yours? I prepared. Well, wait, man, it's a lot that they're asking for these days. They're asking for a lot. I prepared. What do you do when you want to buy a house? You prepare. What do you do when you want to buy a car? You prepare. What do you do when you get want to get your nails done, hair done, take a trip? What do you do? What do you do when you want to celebrate somebody's birthday? What do you do? Well, what are you going to do with your worship? We must prepare. Somebody type it in. We must prepare. We, everybody type it in. Everybody type it in. You don't just come and flip God something. No, we must prepare our worship. That worship of preparation is seen in the building of the altar. Number two, the Lord helped me get through it this evening. 
It's seen in the preparation of the sacrifice. Oh my God. No, you just take the animal in the Old Testament. You just take the animal and just put it on the altar. No, you didn't. The animal, the sacrifice, what you brought had to be prepared. The selection of the sacrifice, the individual offering, the sacrifice would select an appropriate animal, such as a bull, sheep, goat, dove, or pigeon, or other items such as grain, flour, oil, based on the type of offering prescribed for their specific situation or purpose, based on what they want to give, they had to get something unique and they had to go through the selection. Then there was the presentation. You had to present it to the priest. The person offering the sacrifice would bring the chosen animal or items to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle or temple. The priest served as an intermediary <clears throat> between the offer and God, overseeing the ritual and ensuring its proper execution. We want to make sure everything is done copacetic, done the right way, in order. Then there was the examination of the sacrifice. Before the sacrifice could be offered, the priest would examine the animal to ensure that it met the requirements outlined in the law. Thank God we're not under the law. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice, but there's a principle here. The principle is that you didn't just offer anything to God. You didn't just do anything. You prepared. And even the sacrifice, the altar had to be built and the sacrifice had to be prepared. Many times they had to lay hands on the sacrifice. Then there was the slaughtering of the sacrifice. Then there was, amen, the way the sacrifice was laid out on the altar. I never will forget um, 30 years ago, I was in a service and the woman of God was teaching, amen, uh, Dr. Iona Locke. And she was teaching us how to offer our gifts to the Lord. Back in those days, wasn't a whole lot of electronic people was giving cash. She was talking about that. It, you Don't bring God some old mad dollar balled up in your hand. Mm -mm. Get your money and open it up. Open your money up. Make sure it's nice. Lay it out right. Go get your envelope. Put your money in there nice. Don't ball it up and just give God anything. Then you fill it out. Make it nice. Put your stuff together. She took time to teach people that there's an attitude, there's a posture that you have, you should have in your presentation to the Lord. You got some people want to walk around and just throw it on the altar and just say, no, it ought to be brought before the Lord. It's presented. They gave the offering and put it in the hands of the priest. They carried it, they brought it, and they gave it to the priest. And it wasn't over because the priest would check it out. The priest would look at it and make sure it was right. Sometimes it was unacceptable. No, this is not right, this is unacceptable. Wow, there's a principle here that you can't give God anything any way that you want to because your worship is in your preparation. There's a metaphor for balling up, amen, a few dollars and just throwing it in the basket. That's what she was teaching us, that that's not the way you worship God. And you prepare, even before you get to the house of God, you need to determine. Certain times the Holy Spirit will call me to call forth a specific offering. You need to be ready to respond in faith. But other than that, you've already prepared. You know what your tithe is. Well, you've prepared that. You're not coming to church to see if you feel it, if I feel led. No, I prepared to worship the Lord. There is the placement of the sacrifice on the altar. There's the burning of incense in many cases that accompany the burnt offering. Then there's the consumption of the offering. Many of the offerings in the Old Covenant, the priests were commanded to consume. It was for them. And what was not consumed, they had to dispose of it a certain way. God is concerned about what happens with this offering. God is concerned. Preacher can't just get the money and do whatever he want to do. God is concerned that his house and his ministry and his Levites are taken care of. God is concerned about the work of the Lord. God is concerned about the needs of the people being met. You can't just do anything with the Lord's offering. My God. Then there was atonement and communion that had to be done. These rituals and procedures surrounding sacrifices were central 
to ancient Israel's worship practices and were considered, amen, essential for maintaining purity, atonement, and communion with God according to the prescriptions in the Mosaic law. So when you talk about sacrifice, the sacrifice itself had to be prepared. I want to read this for you. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse number 11, David says this, Now, my son, the Lord be with thee. He's talking to Solomon. And prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God as he hath said to thee. Make sure you do what God told you to do. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord your God. Now look at verse 12. Verse 12, David is talking to his son. He's still alive. David is alive and his son is going to be king. And he says, you want the Lord to give you wisdom and understanding. You sort of wonder where did Solomon get the notion to pray for wisdom and understanding? He got it from his daddy. His daddy told him, you're going to need wisdom and understanding. So then after his daddy is dead, he prepares a sacrifice. How many? 1,000 bullocks Solomon prepares. And the preparation itself got God's attention. It was the worship of preparation. And God came to Solomon and said, Solomon, what can I do for you, son? And he remembered the words of his daddy. And his daddy said, you need wisdom and understanding. This is what prompts Solomon to pray for wisdom and understanding. Look at verse number, verse number 13. He says, I want you to prosper if thou take heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. Be strong, be of good courage. Dread not, don't be afraid, nor be dismayed. Verse 14. Now, behold, in my trouble, in my trouble, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, in my trouble, in my trouble, I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talent, that's a million, a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight. For it is in abundance, timber also and stone have I prepared that thou mayest add thereto. Look at all this stuff that David got. I got gold. I got silver, a thousand, thousand talents. I got all this gold. I got wood. I got brown. And he said, what stands out to me is he said, I prepared in my trouble. What? Everything wasn't wonderful? No. Everything wasn't wonderful in my life, but I still prepared. You had needs? Yes, I had needs, but I still prepared. <laughs> Do you know trouble doesn't release you from being a mother? You still got to be a mother. Trouble doesn't stop bills from coming. Trouble, you think trouble would allow you to just get a pass. You got sick, you fell, you hit your head, you was out of commission for a week or two. You think trouble would make the world stop for you. No, the world don't stop. You still got obligations. You still got responsibility. You still got to be accountable. You still got to do what you got to do. The world does not pity you for your trouble. Why do we want the world to stop for us to do something special for God? Let me tell you something. The world is going to keep on going. The devil's going to keep on chasing you. Trouble is going to keep on knocking on your door. But David said, in the midst of my trouble, I prepared. I worship God even though I was going through. I sacrificed even though I was dealing with hell and high water. David had Goliath trouble. David had money trouble. David had marriage trouble. David had family trouble. David had trouble, had trouble controlling his flesh. And yet in all that trouble, he prepared Because the preparation is worship. The preparation is worship. My God. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse number 1, Furthermore, 
David the king said to the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God have chosen, is yet young and tender. The work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared, I prepare, I prepare, I prepare. Are you prepared today? Are you prepared to worship the Lord? Are you prepared to honor him? I have prepared. And I didn't just prepare. I did it with all my might for the house of my God. The gold for things made of gold, the silver for things of silver, brass for things of brass, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glittering stones, divers colors, all manner of precious stones, marble stones in abundance because I set my affection to the house of my God. I have of my own personal proper good. I gave my gold, my silver, which I have given to the house of my God, and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. David said, I prepared my personal stuff because that's what my heart is. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. People don't pre prepare because it don't mean nothing to them. If you got a man that prepared I that, that nice dinner that I talked about, that's because he loved you. You got a woman that prepared and set it up and made it all nice for you. That's because she loved you. You got kids that have prepared and got a little plan together to do something nice for you. That's because they love you. You got a bishop and a church and a ministry that's preparing to serve you and to minister to you and make sure all of your spiritual needs are met in a daily bread, in an evening sacrifice, in a Sunday morning worship, in a Wednesday night Bible study, in an everyday prayer. My God! That's because somebody loves you. The preparation is the worship. And David said, the reason I'm prepared is because I set my affection to the house of God. Let me wrap the message up. Let me wrap it up. Let me wrap it up. The preparation of worship, the worship of preparation, I should say, the worship of preparation, the altar is built. You build the altar. Number two, the sacrifice is prepared. It must be prepared. We bring the sacrifice of praise. You don't just bring out anything. We prepare. Listen, when you hear a music presentation, I tell these pastors that are online and doing different things, I say, man, we hear your music is whack. Your, your stuff is whack. Number one, you haven't hired professionals. Number two, they ain't prepared. They ain't practiced. And it's a mess. And you put this out there and this is what you offer to the Lord. Sometimes I hear the preacher preach. I hear the teacher teach. What is this? That's a mess. You haven't prepared. It's, it's obvious that you haven't prepared. Here you up in front of the people. You got 200 people out here, 1,000 people out here, and you up here looking for a script. You can't find this verse. What is you doing? Did, oh, you didn't know? You, you didn't know? You didn't know you was preaching? You didn't know you was teaching? What's wrong with you? You prepare. I give God glory and honor. But you know why people tune in to hear me preach? Because they know I'm going to be prepared. They know I'm going to have something to say. They know I'm going to put my heart and soul into it. I'm not just getting up here off the top of my head. You must prepare. Because the worship is the preparation. That's where the power is at. That's where your heart is moved. It's in the preparation. And in my conclusion... The consecration of ministry. For people went into ministry, the prophets, priests, and kings, before people went into leadership in any capacity, the Levites had to be consecrated. Those that are serving in ministry had to be prepared. Those that are armed services, the armed, the police, the Air Force, the Army, Navy, Marines, they have to be prepared. A judge, an attorney, you have to be prepared. We're going to court. We have to be prepared. You got to be prepared. You're going to the bank. You want to be prepared. Whatever you're doing, even the consecration for ministry, there had to be preparation. That preparation, biblical times, consecrating a person in ministry involved a process of dedication and setting apart for sacred service. This process varied depending on the specific context and the type of ministry being undertaken, whether it was priesthood, prophetic ministry, leadership roles within the religious community. In a general sense, there had to be a divine call and a divine appointment. There had to be preparation and training. 
understanding their responsibilities, learning practical skills that relate to their ministry, developing spiritual disciplines. They had to be the anointing with oil. The oil was a common practice in consecrating individuals for ministry in biblical times. The act of anointing symbolized the pouring out of God's spirit upon the individual, empowering them for their appointed task. Hands were laid on them. Hands were laid on them in the sight of the people, showing that God affirmed them, that the leadership affirmed them, that the people should receive them. That's why you don't receive every anybody coming and talking, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm a man, I'm a woman of God. Who laid hands on you? When were you ordained? Who sanctioned you to do what you do? Have you been consecrated? The word consecrated means to be set apart for a specific use. Sanctified, we're set apart from. We're out of an environment that's not conducive to that which is holy. But when you're consecrated, you're moved to a place where you're only used for that which is holy. I was talking through some issues this morning about using the internet for ministry. And I've sanctified this internet for ministry for me. What do you mean? I only use it for ministry. I've, I've consecrated it for ministry. I, I, I don't use it for social activity. I don't use it to play and to act silly. And to, I don't do I use it for ministry. I consecrate it. And there's some people that don't understand the preparation or the sacrifice that goes into a person's effectiveness in ministry. You can't be everybody's buddy. You can't be everybody's friend. You need to be professional. You need to be holy. You need to be different. You need to be sober, serious, mature, accountable, honest. Did you get that? Could you try again? Yeah, you need to be honest so that you can be effective in ministry. Then there was public recognition and commissioning. My God, one that was consecrated, there was ongoing support and ongoing accountability. There was a continual renewal of dedication. Every year, every two years, they were reaffirmed. They were re-dedicated and renewed. Anybody that knows on a professional level, you have to have your license renewed. Sometimes there are courses and learning that you have to continue to go in. Why? Because you're being consecrated. You, this is what you do. And when it comes to that which is holy, that which is spiritual, there is no, there, there, there's nothing different. Oh, you got to be renewed. You got to be affirmed. You need, you need to reestablish your dedication. Continue the learning. Continue to walk with the Lord. It's that, that's the worship. Some people say, I'm coming to worship God. And you lift your hands. That is a form. That's a form. But I, I want to present to you tonight that the preparation, the preparation is worship. In conclusion, Exodus 29 and 29 says this. The holy garments belonging to Aaron are be, are." Uh, are to belong to his sons after him so that they may be anointed in them and be consecrated in them. The son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. You shall take the ram of the consecration and boil his flesh in the holy place. Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things by which the atonement was made in order to consecrate and sanctify them. But no one else shall eat them because they are holy. If any of the flesh from the consecrations or from the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire and it shall not be eaten because it is holy. I just wanted to show you a little bit of what went into building an altar, what went into preparing the sacrifice and what went into consecrating a person for ministry. It was a whole lot, what they had to wear, those consecrated, what they could eat and could not eat, where they could go, who they could marry. 
the things they could do and the things they could not do. That is the worship. It's the preparation. It's all that go into. And so in conclusion on tonight, we are preparing to worship the Lord. I call on you, people of God, to prepare to worship the Lord in this supersede offering. Come with me as we've been led by the Spirit of God to present to the Lord a $500 seed, a $1,000 seed. I want every one of you to take this challenge, this call, these instructions, take this serious and prepare. Don't be casual and say, oh, I'll give a little bit now and I'll give a little bit later. I'll do this. The worship is in the preparation. Let's prepare to worship the Lord together. You got to make some phone calls. You got to change some things. You got to arrange some things. But when it's time to present, make sure that you are prepared to present. Father, thank you now for the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're teaching us to build the altar and to prepare the sacrifice and to consecrate ourselves for ministry because the worship is the preparation. I pray that our hearts will be pure, that our minds, like David, that we would set our affection to the house of God, to the things that are holy, to the work of ministry. Let us set our heart on it. Let us worship from our heart and let us prepare in worship. Our attitude, our mind, and even our substance, what we sacrifice and what we give to you, let us do it from a prepared heart because we see it in your word tonight that the preparation is the worship. Smile upon us and favor us is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Clap your hands for the word of the Lord. Come on, clap your hands. That's a miracle. We got through all this information tonight. Amen. Thank God for it. All right, let's prepare our hearts to worship through our giving. Amen. It is the middle of the week. Uh, we always honor the Lord with the tithe. That's holy unto the Lord. And then finally, amen, we give the midweek sacrifice. Let's do that right from where you are. Go ahead and worship the Lord from your location. Navigate on the screen and release your support to the work of the Lord. I'm so looking forward to seeing you Sunday as we present to the Lord, amen, our special sacrificial worship. Make sure you're doing all that you can to prepare to worship the Lord. We will be at the Silver Spot uh, movie cinema again this Sunday. You want to get there as early as you can, 9.30, 9.30. Get there early as you can, amen, as we will be starting amen, very promptly. And uh, we're going to have communion. Those that are watching by way of the Internet, make sure you are prepared to worship the Lord with us as we receive the Lord's table on this Sunday. Holy Spirit, we will leave this connection, but never our connection with you. Smile upon us and favor us. Burn this powerful word in our hearts on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, love you, love you. I can't wait to see you next time. Until then, peace to the family. Well, praise the Lord. This is Pastor Clark here, just encouraging you to reach for your super seed. There's a buzz going around bzz, stating that the super seed is coming. The date is April the 7th, it's first Sunday at the Silver Spot. We're reaching for 500 to 1,000 or exceedingly above that. Whichever way you want to worship the Lord, bring it on the first Sunday in April at the Silver Spot. Bring your 500, bring your 1,000 or more. God bless you and we'll see you there. It's Super Seed Sunday, April 7th. If you believe in the power of prayer, join us at 8 a.m every morning, Monday through Friday, on our prayer line, 712-775-8968. The access code is 304-282. Join Bishop Clark Monday through Fridays at 9 a.m. for our daily bread. It's refreshing, it's enlightening, and it's empowering. 
We'll see you there. Good evening, everybody. We thank God you joined us on this midweek service. The word has been enriching and empowering and it's helping us maximize our potential. Join us Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. for prayer. God bless you and we'll see you there. There are several ways to support the Body of Christ Assembly through your giving. Through our cash app, dollar sign, B-O-C-A-C-H-U-R-C-H. You can mail in your donation to BACA at 20900 Miles Parkway, Warrensville Heights, Ohio, 44128. Or you can call in your donation to 216-475-6327. Remember, every seed brings forth a harvest. Begin your gifting today.